All right, so <clears throat> John chapter 18. We just left off John chapter 17. Last week was the, the entire chapter was dedicated to a, as a prayer from Jesus unto God. And this is, that was the last thing basically that they did um, when they had their last supper. So they were still in that place. Now they've left. And that's what verse 1 says. When Jesus had spoken these words, talking about his prayer to God, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, wherein was a garden. So he goes to the garden of Geth Gethsemane. And it says he went there um, to which he entered and his disciples. But in the other Gospels, we see that he brings Peter and James and John with him. And um, of course, Judas knows of this place. This is, this is a place that Jesus would like to go to. This is a garden you'd go. He'd spend time there, spend time in prayer or whatever. But Judas knew about this place. He knew this is a place that Jesus would like to go to. And it was um, easy for him to find Jesus there because he betrays him this night. And it says, Judas then in verse 3, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So it's late at night. Jesus is in this garden and he goes there to pray. And we don't see that prayer that's found in the other Gospels. This is, the book of John is great because there's, there's so much different content in here than there is in the other three Gospels. And you really get the full picture when you read the book of John. Um, a lot of the other ones have a lot of similarities. They all have differences. They all have a little bit in, in the stories that you don't get from the other books. But we get this full, complete picture. This doesn't really focus on him praying and, and, and asking God. But we're going we're gonna to get in, into that in a little bit because that's going to be in Matthew 26. If you want to keep a finger in Matthew 26, we'll be there in just a few minutes. But um, So Judas comes. He brings these cops, basically, right? These officers. And they're coming to arrest Jesus. So they've got torches, lanterns, and weapons. So they don't know what to expect. They're all armed. He brings this armed band of men to come and arrest Jesus Christ. In verse 4, I, I, love, I love this story here. It says, Jesus, therefore, knowing, he knew what they were there for. He knew what had to happen to him. He said unto him, he says, whom seek ye? Said, Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And look at verse 6. It says, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. So just Jesus responds. He said, look, well, who are you looking for? Jesus answered. He said, I am he. Now remember the power of those words. Jesus Christ being the I am he. He's God in the flesh. God is I am. That, is, that was his name. That's how, who he revealed himself unto Moses when he said, tell him that I am hath sent thee. Jesus Christ said, I am he. And he said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. It's a very powerful statement. It's so powerful that all he has to say is I am he. And they literally all just went backward and fell down to the ground. Now, I don't think they just did that. And this is me personally. You know, come to your own conclusion on this. I think there was just so much power in his words that that's why they just fell over backwards when they heard that. I don't think it was just because they were all afraid. I mean, there's a big band of, of people and there was very few that, they were, that were there with Jesus. It was Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Okay, And they had a whole band of men with weapons. right? And they were going to arrest them. Now, they might have had some fear of Jesus Christ, and rightfully so, but I don't think... That just when he said, I am he, that is just because they were afraid that they all fell down. I think there was that power in his answer saying, I am he. And, and to me, that alone is just, is just incredible. That, that he could just say those words. I mean, God spake this whole world into existence. Just by the power of his words, just by speaking, he was able to create the entire universe. Let there be light. God said, he spake that and then there was light. And there it is. Jesus just said, I am he. And boom, they all just fell backwards. So then verse 7 says, so he asks them again. He's like, well, who do you seek? Who are you here for? You know, as they're, as they're getting themselves up. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which thou gavest me. I have lost none. So now he's just saying, okay, he knows, he knows why they're there, and he knows he needs to, to accomplish this goal of being arrested and being put to death. So he's saying, okay, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm not going to put up a fight. Take me, but let these guys go their way. He didn't want them getting hurt or getting, getting killed. 
So he's saying, I'll go with you, you know, I'll go peacefully, just let these guys go their way because he's, he was keeping them, he was watching over them, he's protecting them. And he even continued to do that when he had to be taken away. But then in verse 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Peter, and it, Peter kind of has a tendency to do this quite a bit. And, and I preached on him before. And he's, again, don't get me wrong. Peter was a great guy, a great apostle, a great disciple of Jesus Christ. Did all kinds of great miracles. But he has a tendency to be hasty in his actions sometimes. Hasty in his words and hasty in what he does. Jesus just got done saying, you know, like, um, you seek me, let these go the way. He, and he's basically saying, okay, you know, just don't do anything with these guys. And now Peter takes out his sword. Now, he, you know, again, his, his heart is always in the right place. His heart is always to serve God. But he takes out his sword and he, and he actually, you know, takes a swipe at one of the guys and the guy, you know, dodges or whatever, just barely enough, but he cuts the guy's ear off. And I don't, it's not in, it's not in this account, but Jesus actually heals that guy's ear. He, he, he heals them, makes it all better. But um, then Jesus said unto Peter, like verse 11, he says, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And this is, um, you remember when, when Jesus was telling the disciples that he needed to go and be put to death, and Peter tells him, he says, Lord, you know, that shall not be. He's like, that's, don't say that. Like, that's not going to happen to you. And that's when Jesus rebuked Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. When Peter was basically telling him no, when Jesus was saying he was going to go to be put to death. And Peter's like, no, you're not. And Jesus is like, get thee behind me, Satan. And he was rebuking him. And again, we see Peter, you know, getting out a sword when it's coming time for Jesus to accomplish this. And that's why he says here, he says, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And these words are important. To flip back, if you would, to, to Matthew 26. There's a very important lesson to learn here because in Matthew 26, we're going to see what Jesus was praying in the garden that very night before Judas came with the band of men to arrest him. So he, he says unto Peter, you know, look, this is the cup that my Father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? Like This is, this is God's will. This is what he has for me to do. So shouldn't I just do this? And that's what he's trying to explain to Peter. Like, put your sword away. It's not time for that. It's time right now for me to be arrested for this to happen. It, it needs to take place. Look at verse 36 of Matthew 26. The Bible reads, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And I misspoke a little bit earlier. He was there with his disciples, but he brings Peter, James, and John with him a little bit further out by himself in the garden. We see that here. And um, so he says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. Verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face, so he's, he's off by himself, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. So Jesus did not, we see here clearly, Jesus did not want to go through everything that he had to go through. He didn't want to. He, he, was, he was facing it. He knew what needed to be done, but he, he's, he's praying to God and he's asking him, God, is there any other way that, that we can accomplish your will to where I don't have to go through this? He didn't, I mean, it wasn't something that he was looking forward to doing. And think about it. He knew what was going to happen. He knew all the things. I mean, if you were, put yourself in his shoes, if you were facing being hung on a cross to die. I mean, that's not as simple as just like getting a bullet to the head. They did, you know, they whipped him and beat him up, made him carry his cross and nailed him to a cross and he just hung up there. 
and beauty is just left there to die and there's you know i've read all kinds of things i don't know how true they are but they, they're probably true i don't have any reason to think that it's a lie on on what your body goes through when it's just hanging in that position i mean especially just the pain coming from your hands and your feet from the nails being driven through them but then like the way that your chest is um trying to get air and you start hanging and your and your bones come out of joint and it, i mean it's just it's just a really really brutal painful way to die and and facing that and facing taking the sins of the Lord is just everything that he had to do he's not looking forward to that at all and and he's he's earnestly praying to God but very important to note obviously Jesus was without sin he never sinned one time Jesus did not sin in asking God for another way it's not a sin to ask for a different path. If something's coming up, you could, you could go to God in prayer and ask, but it's always important in your prayer. And this is why Jesus didn't sin is because he was still looking to fulfill God's will. Like that's what he was doing. He was there to fulfill the purpose of fulfill the will. You know, sometimes there's more than one way to skin a cat. And so he's talking to God and saying, hey, you know, can, can we still do this, but do it a different way? Can, you know, is there a way that we can, you can, we can accomplish the purpose without me having to drink this cup. So that was his first prayer, was if it be possible. He's saying, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not going to do it, God, but if, it's, if, it, if there's any possible way, he says, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as that way. He's saying, you know, not trying to make my own will supersede your will, God. I'm just asking you if there's another way to do this. And then he said in verse 42, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done so we see he's i mean he's he's dedicated and he's saying i will do god what you want me to do uh, it's not it's not the way that i would like to take if there's another way i'd like to probably do a different way of doing it but god your will be done and even just asking for a different path to still in his will it doesn't make you any less spiritual either so remember that you know problems that you come up with in your life don't ever be afraid to ask god god can can you use me in another way can we do something else if you see something that comes up and it, and it troubles you and, you and your heart's troubled and you're like man i, I don't really i don't really want to do it we ought to always have the mindset where whatever god wants me to do i'm going to do it right i i will do it like that that i'm not going to be disobedient i will do what god wants me to do but if you see something in lying in, in your path or, or a path that uh, the way that your life is headed a certain direction or something that, that's coming up in front of you that's real difficult, you, you know, go to God with that and ask Him. Say, God, you know, I wanted, I'm going to do your will. I'm going to do it. But can we, is there another way for me to get through this? And it doesn't make you any less spiritual or fearful or anything. Just, just do it as long as you have it in your heart that what God's will is, is needs to be done. If there's another way that God will provide for you to, to accomplish a goal, then great. But um, still bring it to God. And um, I also want to point out here, notice also that even though Jesus didn't want to go through what, he, what, what was before him, he still did it anyways, even knowing that he had the power to back out of it any time. Jesus could have... I mean, even though, Judas, even though he knew Judas was coming to betray him and they had a whole band of men with weapons and they were outnumbered and, and they, you know, they had all this stuff. At any moment, Jesus could have just made it all stop. Look at verse 52 of Matthew 26, if you're still there. Verse 52. This is when he's telling Peter to put up his sword. This is the, the other account. We actually get a little bit more information here. Verse 52 says, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. So he's saying, like, we, this isn't a physical fight. We don't need to fight this. Like, if I wanted to get out of this mess, Peter, I don't need you to take your sword and to try and, and, and to get me out of this. He's like, I could pray unto God and I'd have legions of angels here to protect me. That's how confident Jesus was. But even though he had all of that power and God would have answered him, if Jesus said he's not lying, God wouldn't have been like, no, Jesus, you have to go through this and I'm going to make you go through this. 
He could have done that. He could have said, ask God to, bring, to, to protect him and the send angels, and God would have done it. And it would have happened. Jesus knew that power. He knew he was capable of doing it, yet he still did it. It was totally voluntary what Jesus did for us. Completely voluntary. But, um, you know, at no point was he, was he forced into what he was doing. Now, that doesn't absolve, because I've, I've heard this before, and it's actually just ridiculous to me. It doesn't absolve what Judas did. It doesn't absolve what any of these people did, what Pilate did, what, you know, everybody that condemned Jesus. It doesn't absolve them. Just because Jesus allowed it to happen doesn't mean that, oh, well, there's no blame on them now because Jesus allowed it to happen and it had to happen. No, they were still wicked and evil in doing those things they did. Let's flip back over to John 18. But it's, the, that's, it's a really... A really interesting um, course of events here that happened within the Garden of Gethsemane and with them coming and everything else. Let's keep reading here in verse number 12 of John 18. It says, Then the band and the captain and the officers of, of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. So they arrest him, they handcuff him. It says, And led him away to Annas first, for he was father in law to Caiaphas, which was a high priest that same year. And I thought this was kind of interesting. I did a little bit of study into it, but Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests. And I don't know, I couldn't find very, too much information on how often that happens. Like I always kind of thought there was one high priest, but this is definitely the case. I was able to find plenty of evidence. And Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests that year. And, and um, Annas was the father-in-law to Caiaphas. And it explains here, it reiterates or explains that Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And um, that's when they were plotting to kill Jesus Christ. Caiaphas says, you know, that they were worried about the Romans coming and taking away their place. If you remember that, um, that was right after Lazarus was, was brought back from the dead. And they're like, we got to stop this guy. Everybody's believing on him. They're gonna, you know, and they know that that people are proclaiming him the king. He's the, you know, it's the return of the king, the king of the Jews. And they think, well, the Romans are gonna hear about this. They're gonna think that we're, you know, have an insurrection and that we're gonna set up our own government and all this other stuff. And they didn't want that to happen. They hated Jesus, so they're like, they're gonna come and take away our because they were the ones ruling over the Jews, right? The Pharisees and these priests, like they were ruling over the Jews. Um, for the most part. They were still under Roman rule, but, but they didn't want to lose their job, their position, and where they were at. And Caiaphas was actually, it, said, it says, because he was the high priest, he made that prophecy. Like, like God still used him as the high priest to, um, to speak the word of God in that sense and, and to, to prophesy that Although I've said this in that, in that other sermon, I think that he was thinking something different like, well, look, guys, we just need to put him to death because it's better that this one man be put to death than all of us lose our place and everything else. That's probably what he was thinking and meaning when he said that. But it was still true because it hold a, a different meaning according to God and in the word of God that it was expedient that one man should die for the sins of the whole world, that, that Jesus needed to die so that we all can have salvation. That's why that was so important. Um, but let's keep reading here. Verse 15 says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. And we see, in an, and again, in another account, I think it's in Matthew, that everybody fled. When Jesus got arrested, all of his disciples, everybody fled. Everybody forsook Jesus. Jesus was left alone. But after they arrested him, then a couple of them came back. John came back and Peter followed. It said Peter followed afar off. So Peter didn't. John got like right back up there with him. John came back into the, into the um, ended up with him here in the, at the high priest's place um, because he went into the palace of the high priest with Jesus. John did. He ended up coming back to him right away. But Peter was a, far, was, was a ways off. He was kind of watching from, from the background, just waiting to see what happened. And um, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. But um, he wasn't allowed in then right away because he didn't come in with the whole group of people. So then he's outside the gate. And then we see John, 
sees him over at the gate. He goes over and he talks to the woman that's, that's keeping the gate. He lets Peter in. It says in verse 16, But Peter stood at the door without, then went out the other that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then said the damsel, and this is the first time we see Peter denying Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to go over all this. We're kind of going to skip over these verses because I preached this on John 13, I think it was, when Jesus warned Peter that he was going to deny him three times. I went into all of these different um, scenarios. So we're just going to read through this where it says, you know, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And I love this response from Jesus Christ. And this is something that we need to take to heart. This is a type of a fearless attitude that's missing from a lot of Christians today. For a couple of reasons. One, we need to, we need to speak the truth openly. Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He didn't, he didn't withhold truth from people. He didn't say like, you know, um, that he wasn't going to preach something because it was too hard or because it was too negative or because he might offend people or he might hurt someone's feelings. He didn't withhold God's word and what he had to preach for any of those reasons. He preached what needed to be preached. He said, I spake openly to the world. And that's why we publish our sermons on the internet. That's why we go out and we preach the gospel and, and we're not locking our doors. We want people to come in and, and you know, be a part of our church and see what we have to preach and what we believe and what we have to teach about Jesus Christ. He says, I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always are. He's like, look, you guys are always there. You've heard what I have to say. Why are you asking me now? And the reason why they're asking him anyway is because they're, they're always trying to trip him up in his words. They're trying to catch him at something. They're trying to, to make him slip up so that they could have something to accuse him by, which is why he ends up just not saying anything to him. There's people that, you know, they're just looking for a reason to argue or to fight or to get you in trouble. There's no reason to talk to those people. If that's what their motive is, if that's what their goal is, look, Jesus didn't, you say, oh no, you got to preach the gospel to him. Jesus didn't. When these people were out to kill him, he didn't preach the gospel to them. He kept silent. If anything, he just rebuked them a couple times and, and just said, look, he's like, in secret, I have said nothing. He's like, I haven't, I'm, not, I'm not going around and teaching different things and in private than I am out in public. We don't have some secret doctrines of our church that, that no one else will know about until you become a member like, you know, like the Mormons do that they have their little secret meetings and their secret temple and you have to learn the secret handshakes and learn the extra truth about, about what they really believe to try to, to sucker people in and, and tell you this is overview and then once you know the secret, oh, now you're going to know the real truth. We don't have any of that. It's not like, oh, you can, you're not allowed into you know, all this other nonsense that that cult believes. Jesus said, I speak openly to the world. And that's exactly what we do here. And that's what, what everybody needs to do. Um, every Christian needs to do. Don't withhold that truth. The way you believe about something shouldn't be a mystery to people. It should be well known. It's like, it's like these people that, um, the Christians that deep down, they know what the Bible says about them being the head of their household. And, and you know, they'll believe that. But when they're in a group of people, or their wife's around to say, and they're always making jokes, oh yeah, she, she's the head of, you know, here's the boss, and I just listen to what she says and what she does, and they even do that at home, but deep down they have a different belief, like, no, I should be in charge, but she doesn't listen to me, and all this other nonsense. That's not the way it should be. You shouldn't be like that with anything. If you believe something, hey, do it, you know, act it out, be, what, be who you're supposed to be in the Bible. If you're the, the husband, embody your role. Do what you're supposed to do. And, um, you know, it shouldn't be just some secret doctrine that you keep to yourself is my point with that. Let's keep reading. Verse number 22. So Jesus answers them, you know, basically says, 
you know, why are you asking me what I've said and what I believe and what I teach? I have been teaching this for years now and you have all have had the opportunity to come and hear me. You just ask anyone who's heard me what I teach and what I believe. That was his answer. And look what happens in verse 22. It says, And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And you know, there's nothing new under the sun. This is just a typical thug, a typical officer who's supposed to be probably a peace officer is really just a thug that probably got picked on when he was younger and now feels big and bad and tough because he's an officer and, um, and he's going to smack people around that, that just say things that they don't like. And this is exactly what's going on. I just saw a video the other day of a, of a cop and it was, he wanted to like search some guy's car and the guy's saying like, no, you know, I, I'm not consenting to a search. And, and they were going back and forth and the cop just went up to him and just went whap and like smacked him in the head or something and then took his keys and tossed him to his buddy. He's like, search the car. Just, just no respect whatsoever for people in general. They want to do what they're going to do. And um, I think the guy got fired or something, laid off or whatever, whatever they do. He probably, he's probably getting a paycheck anyways because that's the way they do it with the, with the cops these days is that they just, you know, anytime they do anything wrong, no, there's never a punishment unless it's caught on video and then the punishment's like a paid vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just it's paid leave. Like that, you, you work in the office, we're still going to pay him. Like, it's not like assault. It's not like, hey, you just smacked this guy in the head. I mean, what if that guy would have smacked the cop in the head and be like, get out of here. <laughs> he probably would have gotten killed. And then, and then the cop would have gotten off and just, oh yeah, you attacked me. I feared for my life. Boom. Done. But that's the way it is these days and that's why it's so important to keep a video camera with you everywhere you go so you can document this stuff. But anyways, I don't want to get too off on that with this growing police state that we live in. But we see Jesus was subject to it too. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised if it happens to us. I'm not saying not to fight against this. And look what Jesus answers him too. He doesn't just, you know, he didn't get physical. But he says in verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? He's saying, look, he didn't threaten to harm anyone. That's why he's speaking evil. He's not saying like, oh man, I'm going to kill you. He said, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of it. You know, bring it up and, and, and bear witness that I said something. But if, you, if I didn't speak evil, then why are you hitting me? You know, like, what are you, what are you doing smacking me? And I, well, a lot of these cops don't understand. Like this officer, I mean, he just, he just slapped. He said with the palm of his hand, he slapped the son of God. He slapped God in the flesh. I've done a lot of sins in my life. I would hate to look back and be like, I actually struck God in the face. I struck the Son of God in the face. Like that's that's horrible. But think about this, and 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 what the cops ought to do is think about this: the way that they're treating people. You start treating a Christian like that, that's one of God's sons. When someone doesn't do anything wrong, now look, I'm not talking about people who, who, you know, are thugs and they, and they you know, and they're, they're, they're the ones that are raping people and killing people and, and, you know, causing all kinds of havoc and they end up getting, getting tussled around a little bit when they get arrested, whatever. You know, I know that's going to happen. I'm talking about the people who don't do anything wrong, who know that they have certain rights that they don't want to have violated. And when you voice your rights, you know, these cops need to realize, hey, if that's a Christian voice in his rights, and you're just gonna, you're gonna, you know, beat him down or whatever you want to do because you feel like a tough guy, you better think twice, with, you know, on, on who you're doing that to as, you know, going after God's children. Because we are God's children. And if, and if we haven't done anything wrong, and you go and do that to someone, and then they pray for you, the Bible says that's like heaping coals of fire on their head. That's what, like, um, in the instance with Pastor Anderson, when he, got, when he got yanked out of his car and tasered and got his head smashed into the broken glass and they were standing on the back of his neck and doing all this stuff, you know, and injuring him, he ended up praying for those people. And, it, and that's not, according to the Bible, you know, him being a man of God and being a child of God, and then praying for those people, it's just like heaping coals of fire on their head. And obviously he meant, he, you know, as any Christian ought to, you, you still want them to, 
to, to repent and see the error of their way and it's not you're not going to take vengeance for yourself. You know, you're going to rely on God. But as a Christian that relies on God, these people need to fear. They ought to fear God and they, and they ought to think twice before they do the actions that they do oftentimes because a Christian that's going to live righteously and not take vengeance on himself, you, you'd probably rather have the vengeance of the man than the vengeance of God coming down upon you. And... Um, I don't we don't we don't know in scripture whatever ended up happening to this guy, but I, I guarantee you it couldn't have been good um, with God's vengeance coming down upon him for, for slapping Jesus like that and all these other people that that did the same thing. Verse number twenty four, let's keep reading. It says now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. So Annas was just interrogating him. He was a high priest, so he left him bound up, he's handcuffed, and he goes to, he sends him to Caiaphas. It says in verse 25, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art, now, art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? So he's saying this is like this guy's brother or cousin or whatever, one of the kinsmen of the guy whose ear. I mean, Peter cut off the guy's ear and he's like, Wait a minute. I think I saw you. Weren't you in, in the garden with him? And he kind of drew attention to himself when he cut off a guy's ear. You'd think you'd be able to remember the face of the guy that did that to your relative, right? And that's what he said in here. And it says, um, but he denied again and immediately the cock crew. And again, we, we, I've already preached on that. I don't want to get into that tonight. Verse 28. <clears throat> then let they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might set that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. And it's kind of funny, because he's saying they delivered Jesus up, and Pilate's like, Okay, well, why why is he here? You know, what has he done that's wrong? And they said, well, if, you know, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. <laughs> that doesn't answer his question. They're saying, you know, and, and I don't know if this has anything to do with this or not, but it says in verse 28 that they brought, they themselves went not into the judgment hall. So they brought Jesus to the judgment hall, but they didn't go into the judgment hall because they didn't want to be defiled. And I don't see any evidence in Scripture that just stepping foot in the judgment hall would defile you for a holy day, for a high day. The, the Bible talks a lot about, you know, when you handle um, dead carcasses and things like that, you are defiled until the even. So when there's high days and holy days and stuff like that, you wouldn't have been able to partake in those feasts and, and in the Passover if you were defiled. You had to keep yourself clean. And that was the preparation day that Jesus was arrested here. And... Um, so they wanted to keep themselves, but I don't understand why they couldn't go into the judgment hall. But when they say here, we say, well, what accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, if you were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. I don't know if it's because they didn't want to lie and just be like, just make something up. I mean, they didn't have a reason to put him to death anyways. Their whole reason was because he said that, uh, you know, just that if he could rebuild the temple in three days, like, like that's a reason to put someone to death, right? And, um, and really it was because he said he was a son of God, but they didn't have an accusation. They just, they just want their will done. So they're like, well, we're just going to bring him unto Pilate and just demand that he put him to death. And so I don't know if they were thinking that if they, if they lied, that they would defile themselves. But verse 31 says, Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. So he's like, okay, you're not going to tell me what he did wrong, then just take him and judge him. I mean, you're capable of, uh, and that's what, the Jews had certain authority to carry out judgment because they had their laws. They had the, the, you know, supposedly they were supposed to be following the law of God and the Roman government allowed them to have their locality and their local government and just kind of take care of things, whatever needed to be done. So he's saying, okay, well, you know, take him and judge him then. Do, you know, do whatever it is that you guys need to do. But the answer him said, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So they had restrictions put on there by the Roman government saying, okay, you know, you can handle things, but only to an extent. If it comes down to something like the death penalty, 
they are not they did not have the authority to to um, dictate those things or to, to have that type of judgment which is exactly the reason why they brought the woman taken in adultery unto Jesus because they knew that by their law adultery was condemnable by the death penalty but I, I and I don't know this for a fact but under Roman law it probably wasn't the death penalty it probably it probably wasn't even against the law you know just like in the United States you just commit adultery and there's no repercussions for it but according to their law they should you know adulterers get put to death so that's why they brought her to Jesus because they wanted Jesus to say yes put her to death because in so doing then he would be usurping authority over the Roman government and they are trying to trick him and catch him in his words so you know people always like to, to point to these um, scenarios like that woman taking an adultery to see like See, Jesus didn't, and, and actually he, he didn't say not to kill her. He said, whoever, whosoever is without, the, you know, without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. So he did say to, to, to put her to death, but he said it in a way that made everybody stop and think and go, well, wait a minute, you know, like, I'm not perfect. I can't, I can't do this. But um, that's why they did that. They didn't have the authority to kill him. So that's why they even brought him to Pilate to begin with. Because they were, they were enraged. They wanted to kill him anyways, but they're trying to do it lawfully. So they bring him to Pilate. It says in verse 32 that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And that death that he should die would be being lifted up from the earth. See, if they were going to kill Jesus Christ, they could have done it. I mean, they, they could have taken him and strangled him or someone could have murdered him in cold blood, right? If they wanted to, they could have done that and they probably could have covered it up because enough people in, in authority wanted him dead and they probably could have just swept it under the carpet or whatever. But this all happened because Jesus prophesied that he was going to be lifted up from the earth. He knew that he was going to be crucified on the cross and that's the way he was going to be put to death, which was done through the authority of the, of the government here with Pilate um, dictating that basically. It says in verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself or did others tell it thee of me? So he's, Jesus is saying, Wait, are you calling me king of the Jews or did, did other people tell you that that's what I am? He's not saying that, that he is. He says in verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? So, and this whole time, Pilate's just trying to figure out what he did because they're not telling him. They're saying, well, look, if he, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. He tries asking Jesus. He goes to the people. And it's like he knew that for envy. He knew the real reason why they brought him to him. He knew that the chief priests envied him because he was gaining the popularity. People were listening to him. He, was, he had followers, you know, and, and all these things that were going on. But... Um, So, he, so he, he answers them. He says, What hast thou done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So now Jesus is saying that he's got a kingdom because he does. And, and he is a king. He's a king of kings and lord of lords. But Pilate then therefore said unto him, so because he said he's got a kingdom, he says, Art thou a king then? Obviously, if you have a kingdom, you're a king. So Pilate's starting to use this line of questioning. Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And that's another profound statement that Jesus makes. Um, just like he did when he said he was the shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. That's another one that says everyone that is of the truth. That means you're from the truth. You're begotten again from the truth, from the word of God. He, you hear Jesus' voice. And it's, you, you, it's, it's hard to, to explain. You know what it's like when you get saved and you have the understanding opened unto you from the Bible. And that's one of the reasons why when people can't understand the King James Bible, it's a major red flag that maybe they're not saved. Because this is the voice of Jesus. These are his words. We should be able, now I'm not saying that you understand absolutely every single thing that's written in this book perfectly and you just have all complete, full and total knowledge. But what I am saying is that you can understand it. 
Okay, you could read these words and say, oh, okay, here's a passage, here's a couple places. You know, I, I don't quite get what it's saying, but you can read it and gain an understanding. And anyone who's saved that, that's tried reading the Bible before they got saved knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because I remember trying to read the Bible and it's like no clue what it's talking about. Just zero understanding, zero concept of biblical truths. Try and understand. And, you know, I, I wasn't the dumbest of kids either, trying, you know, growing up. I, I, I was relatively intelligent, at least as far as um, learning and being able to read and comprehend things. Yet, this book was no clue what it's talking about. But after I got saved, you tell you what, you start reading things and it's. That light is, is there now in your heart and, and, and the Holy Ghost starts opening up things to you. And Jesus said, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. We could hear his voice. And that's why you should be able to tell that, the, that this Bible is, is the word of God and not some other perversion of the Bible because we can hear his voice. These are his words, not the words of man, not some corrupted words, but the word of God and the word of truth. And... Um, it says that's the reason why he came into this world, that he needs to bear witness unto the truth. And he is the truth. He bear witness of himself. He bear witness of the truth, the truth of God's word, and the truth of salvation. And um, Pilate saith unto him, and he's a typical unsaved person, what is truth? He has no idea. And what this is what the world fails at every single time, especially the atheist. Um, they, they can't answer this question, what is truth? If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in, in, in truth, they can't understand it. If we all just came from monkeys, if we all just came, just, just evolved, and everything that's here is here by chance, what really is truth? How could you define truth? You, you have no way of, of really knowing what is true. Because what's true for me might not be true for you. What, you know, what makes any one person better than another? Is it just because there's a group of people that believe a certain way, does that all of a sudden make that better? than someone else because there's just higher numbers. That doesn't make any sense. If we're all just, just these animals and, and, and try to follow this train of thought. You know, if we really, if there is no God and we really are just animals that have just evolved, that have just gotten smarter, we're just smarter animals. Well, is it wrong for, for the, the tiger to kill its prey and to eat it, to, to kill other animals and to, and to do these things? No, it's a tiger, right? It's an animal. Well, if that's all we are, then how could anyone possibly say that it's wrong for me to do what I want? If I want to kill someone, hey, that's what I want to do. You're no better than me. Who are you to tell me rules of what I can and can't do? I'm me. And I'm just an animal. And, and maybe I'm more evolved than you are. And I'm better than you, so I'm going to take these lives because I see fit that that's what needs to be done because I'm more evolved. See, you, you, you can't have a discussion. You could say, oh, well, that hurts other people. You could make up these philosophies and axioms and whatever you want to do. But at the end of the day, if God doesn't exist, if there's not real truth, if there's not something that this is, no, this is the truth, then who, who's to decide anything? It's all arbitrary. It's all meaningless. And that's why a, a, the life of an atheist is a miserable existence. And it's a foolish one at that because the fool said in his heart there is no God. But besides that, and this is why, you know, there's a lot of principles out there and, and I like them, you know, like libertarian philosophies and, and you know, non-aggression principles. I'm, I'm for that stuff to an extent. As, as much as it lines up with the truth, with God's word, yeah, I'm for it. I'm, I'm not for aggressing against other people and being evil, you know, and doing unto others, doing well unto others. Of course, those are all good things. And if you want to make a principle about that, fine. That's great. I'm, I'm all for it. And that's why I lean so much libertarian and everything else in my political philosophies and, and everything else. But as soon as that strays from the Bible, as soon as they say like, oh, well, you can't put homos to death because that's just their choice and what they do in their bedroom is their business. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the truth says. God's word is the truth, okay? Now, what you just said, whatever you just made up there, if it breaks your little principle that, that, that you love so much, too bad because that's wrong and this is right. Because there is a God and God is real and God created everything and God gave us his word and his word is truth. So Pilate can't understand that. 
That's why even though Pilate wanted to release Jesus, he doesn't know the truth, so he just listens to the will of the people, just like a politician just says, okay, well, you guys really want him dead this bad, then go ahead, put him to death. I'm just going to wash my hands over here and, and you know, try to absolve any responsibility for this, even though if he would have known the truth, he would have been like, no, this man did nothing worthy of death. You cannot kill him. That's, what he, that's obviously what he should have done. But he doesn't even know the truth. That's what he has to say. What is the truth? What is truth? He doesn't know. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Verse 39, But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So we're going to close with this. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 23, because we're going to see here a little bit about Barabbas. And this is very symbolic of what Jesus did for us. This, this event of, of Jesus being put to death and Barabbas being set free, because now you have two people, right? And Pilate's saying, okay, one of these people can be, can be set free. We're at least one of them to you. On the one hand, you have Jesus Christ. He was righteous. He did nothing worthy of death the Son of God. On the other hand, you have Barabbas. Now, here it says he was a robber. Look at Luke 23, verse 25. It says, And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. So he wasn't just a robber. He was a robber, yes. But he caused sedition. He was, he was rising, you know, getting the people roused up and commit murder. So he's a murderer, a robber, you know, a sinner, and on the other hand, you have this guy, and, and he was already in prison. He was facing a judgment. He had a punishment to face and probably would have been put to death. I mean, if he was a murderer, they would have killed him, right? But in his place, they had, okay, well, Jesus, we'll put Jesus to death. Now this murderer is going to go free. And that's exactly what he did for us. It's just bringing it down to that individual level. And Jesus did that for all of us. Barabbas can signify or sim symbolize all of us. We are that person that has committed sin, that has broken God's laws, that, that is basically until the moment you get saved, in, in a sense, in, a, in, a, in an abstract sense, you're in prison. You're, you're headed, you're hellbound. You're already condemned. You're already guilty. You've sinned. You deserve this punishment. But Jesus came to pay that so that you can just go completely free. They released Barabbas completely free. He did not have to pay anything for all those sins that he committed, for, for the robbing, the, the, the murder. They let him go. He's off the hook. And that is exactly what Jesus did for us. We, once we put our faith in him, we're, we're pardoned. The, the decree has gone forth that all of our sins are washed and, and will not be remembered anymore. And it's interesting, though, because the world never goes towards the truth. The world goes away from the light. The world is what desired the murderer. That's who they wanted. The, the, the mass, the group, the, 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 ma the majority of the people, they wanted the murderer. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They wanted him put to death. And this is how backwards the world is where they can say, you know, yeah, this guy healed people. He did good. He helped the poor. He did everything right. He never broke the law. He never did anything wrong. But we want him put to death. And we want this guy who commits murder and, and steals and does everything else. Yeah, that's the guy that we want to set free. Yeah, let him out back among us. Maybe he'll kill someone else. That's what we want. That's what the world wants. That's how twisted and backwards and messed up the world is today. That they, they, they would want to have someone like that released as opposed to someone who is good. But the world hasn't changed. That's why the Bible says, Love not the world, neither things that are in it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we should not love the world, have nothing to do with the world, be separate from the world, because that is what the world is all about. It loves the wicked. It loves the sin. It promotes that, and that's what it desires. We need to be of the Father. If you're saved, you are of the Father. And love the things of God, love the truth, and love His Word.
Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and for the amazing sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave in his life for us, dear Lord. And um, we pray that you would please strengthen us in our times of, of facing some, some major hurdles in our life and some problems and some, some difficulties that we might have that, that will be lying ahead. God, we pray that you would please just help us always to go to you in prayer when we have, when we have problems, that we can look to you as our source of, of what we need to do. And um, help us also just to remain steadfast in our faith, dear Lord, that we wouldn't waver and that whatever, whatever might lie in front of us, no matter how difficult it might be, I pray that you would please just strengthen us to continue in your will and just, and just put our own will aside and be able to perform what you have for us to do, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.